Uh, it's a pleasure for me to present the next speaker, which is Sergei Siagin. Sorry for the surname. No, it's correct. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he would talk about high field terahertz spectroscopy of low dimensional speed systems. He's coming from Dresden High Material Magnetic Field Laboratory. So please, Sergey, go ahead. And after the talk, as uh, please, if you have any question, just raise your hand and I will distribute the turn. So thank you, uh, Sergey. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Organizing Committee, for this uh, very good opportunity to present our work and uh, also to listen to other people with interesting uh, presentations. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, my name is Sergei Zvagin. So, uh, yeah, I came from Dresden High Magnetic Field Laboratory, where I'm in charge of High Field uh, ESA Group, High Field ESA Program. So today I'm going to talk about high field teragas spectroscopy of low dimensional spin systems. So I, uh, in my presentation, I will try uh, to cover several, say, um, um, points, several aspects, including uh, presenting what we are doing, what kind of instrumentation we have in Dresden. And I'm going to show several examples, including low dimensional frustrated magnets, which seems to be, you know, last several decades of, uh, of big interest, uh, high topic materials. And then, so I'm going to talk about completely new, uh, from my point of view, or completely novel from my point of view, uh, research area. I'm going to talk about uh, high pressure ESR. So personally, I'm not doing in my lab, but I was uh, using uh, user facility at Hoku University, and I'm, I will try to convince you that doing high field and high pressure, high frequency, uh, so this is something which we call uh, extreme condition and sometimes can be quite uh, productive and quite interesting. So let's go. So first of all, uh, let me describe what we have in Dresden. Uh, I'm working in this area quite a lot. Uh, I think I have some experience and always I was thinking, okay, what can be done better? What kind in sense of what kind of ESR we can, we can, we can do better? And of course, uh, since I've never did uh, inelastic neutron, neutron scattering for me, uh, inelastic neutron scattering was always kind of a queen of research. And I was always thinking, okay, probably with ESR, high field, high frequency ESR, we can do something which can somehow be approached to inelastic neutron scattering. And of course, the most, most idea about, uh, the, the most important idea about this, uh, say, topic, um, I would say broadband or tunable frequency ESR. So I know traditionally ESR is regarded as very powerful techniques and sometimes it's enough just one frequency to look at something which you cannot do with other spectroscopy techniques or just physical techniques or physical methods. But <clears throat> for uh, this kind of uh, research, I would say what is important to have a lot of frequency and the best if we can actually tune or sleep frequency, tune frequency. So, and of course, in combination with high magnetic field, I believe this, uh, this can be really very interesting. So what we have in Dresden, we have, of course, X-band Bruker spectrometer that's commercially available and we are using quite often for characterization or when we would like to see very small, low energy effects uh, with high resolution, high sensitivity. So the frequency range from approximately 50 gigahertz to one terahertz is covered by different um, terahertz sources, uh, sources, including, for instance, gun ga ga or Schottky diodes, or say we have uh, three VDI models. It's quite powerful techniques, quite 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 powerful devices. And for high frequency range, actually, we are using. Uh, backward, backward wave oscillator. So with this set of uh, devices, we can cover frequency range approximately up to uh, 1.3 terahertz. And of course, uh, for high frequency range, of course, we have MVNA network analyzer. And this, this very, this very nicely uh, fits the uh, frequency range, I would say lower than 300 gigahertz. So for high frequency range, even for high frequency range, we have free electron laser and with this device, we can cover frequency range 1.2, uh, 90 gigahertz approximately. And recently we just uh, bought a molecular gas laser, 
And with this guy, we can cover quite broad frequency range from approximately 250 to 4 uh, gigahertz to 4.5 terahertz. So I would say, uh, of course, each device has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. I would say if we would like really to think about tunable frequencies uh, or broad, uh, broadband um, is, uh, I would make it clearly different from multi-frequencies. So multi-frequency is good, but broad, sometimes tunable frequency is uh, it's very, very important. And of course, we should use either a set of different devices or we can use, for instance, two uh, devices, uh, VNA and backward oscillators. And in sense of tunability, of course, these two devices uh, have no um, competitors. Uh, as I said, backward oscillators works, work very nice uh, for, high for high frequency range. And uh, the main principle, so the configuration that we, we have uh, technically works up to one terahertz, but in reality, I would say three, 400 gigahertz, the higher. So for high frequency range, backward oscillators much better, they have much more powerful. About molecular gas laser, I, I know and uh, that many people were complaining about stability and stuff. But what I have to say, I mean, in principle, I'm happy with this device. We are very happy with this device. Of course, it requires some special conditions. The room should be air conditioned and the temperature should be very stable. But in reality, I would say uh, we are very happy and we have uh, we are using this um, device for several high frequencies like 1.5 terahertz, 2.5 terahertz, where use of just normal uh, radiation sources are not possible. And free electron laser also, I would say I'm very happy. The, the, the only thing which I'm not happy, of course, is user facility and sometimes to get a beam line is extremely difficult. And if you get it's usually night shifts and shifts during weekends and not, not much beam time. So. Uh, we can get out of that. But uh, to that extent, of course, molecular gas laser Edinburgh instrument is a very good substitution uh, for this uh, particular, this frequency range. And our strategy is the following. So we just use a molecular gas laser just to test, to see what's going on. And if we need, if we need the tunability of electron laser, or if we need higher frequency, of course, we can apply for beam time and we can get uh, some, some, some beam time. So uh, this is what we have uh, in sense of frequency. So which means we can quasi continuously cover the frequency range practically from 90 Hertz to 90 Hertz. Uh, or field wise, I would say, um, this is uh, what I'm going to show you. This is a very general diagram which shows you different uh, magnetic field uh, sources, cause and it's clear, so if you would like to, to do something uh, with high resolution and high sensitivity, that's better to use to uh, say slowly um, this, which, which, which magnets with very small uh, time constant. This we are talking about superconduction magnets or resistive magnets or hybrid magnets, which are several of them are already available in the world. <clears throat> but and, and with these uh, magnets, we can go up to 45 Tesla. But if to talk about, uh, say, higher um, field, of course, we should uh, use uh, pulsed field magnets. And so we can distinguish between short pulse and long pulses. I would say uh, the difference, of course, is energy. And of course, uh, if you put more energy in the magnet, so you are expecting to have more time for cooling everything down. For instance, pulsed, long pulse, say with pulse duration about, say, one second, one, two second. This is quasi pulse, I would say. Magnets, you pulse and you wait 24 hours until the next time. For short pulsed, uh, for instance, uh, magnets, for instance, up to six Tesla, we can pulse each one hour or couple of hours, depending on the, on the pulse duration. And for higher field range, even higher field range, we should use single turn coils. You can see here, and this, of course, the uh, pulse duration is about several microseconds. So compared to uh, short pulses, which I just showed, it is a pulse duration about several hundreds, I mean, one, two hundreds millisecond. Here we have several microseconds, and we can talk about <clears throat> different techniques, but uh, mainly to get, uh, to, get to get really very high field, you have to go to flux compression. It can be either electromagnetic, and this is approximately up, up to 650 Tesla, 
And for about 2,000 Tesla, you have to use explosive lag conversion. So from my point, uh, as far as I know, the record would record 2.5 kilo Tesla, 1,000 thousand Tesla, it was done uh, somewhere in, uh, in, in Russia. Okay, <clears throat> so what we are doing, so in Dresden, so we are using uh, short pulse magnets in combination with superconducting magnets, so we can go up to approximately 70, 50, uh, 65, uh, 70 Tesla. So uh, just to illustrate what we can do with this pulsed field and uh, tunable frequencies, uh, I would like to show you the frequency field diagram of uh, magnetic excitation and spin one half Gaisenberg chains with alternating Zolchinsky and Mori interaction. So the idea is a, a very, very simple. I mean, if you're looking at the, at the uh, quantum magnets, it's better to start with something simple. And the most, the simplest model uh, system is spin one half Heisenberg chain. So then have spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. But if you have a kind of alternation because of uh, alternating G tensor or Zolchinsky Mori interaction, basically we break in rational symmetry and instead of like that, we have just small tilting. And this tilting actually completely change the, um, completely uh, change the picture. So and <clears throat> what is interesting, so the excitation spectrum for such system can be, can be described using so-called Seinberdon uh, model. Uh, and in, uh, combined with uh, quantum field theory. And this actually model, the theory predicts the presence of solitons and uh, solitons so in, instead of uh, spin-ons. So when we have uh, just break, when we have just flip on one side, flip of the, of the spin, we have kind of a spin, I mean, it's not spin wave, but it's a kind of a soliton wave. So we have localized excitations but these localized excitations actually can, uh, they uh, localize an energy, but they can propagate. Uh, so they can actually propagate through the sample, magnon-like, spin wave-like. And <clears throat> this is solitons. And in addition, we can think about breathers. This is bound state of these solitons. And, uh, and of course, it's very interesting to see what's going to happen in high magnetic field. And this is where the magnetic field, high magnetic field is very necessary. So it's known for this material, this is kappa pyramidine, that in about uh, 40, about 50 Tesla, 48.5 Tesla, so the magnetization gets saturated. So saturation means we completely kill all the quantum fluctuation, all the quantum effects are killed, are suppressed. And in this situation, actually, the uh, these solitons are I mean, magnetic excitations, uh, magnetic excitations are dominated by, 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 by classical magnons. So, and the idea was just to see, okay, let's apply a high magnetic field and see how the breathers actually gets transformed uh, to magnons. So this is kind of trans uh, crossover from uh, say quantum world to classical world. Magnons are quite, quite classical excitations can be described using classical approach and breather or solitons can be described just using uh, yeah, quantum, uh, quantum, uh, quantum, uh, quantum theory, quantum field theory. And this is what we can see. So we can see quite nicely how this actually transform from breather to magnons. Instrumentation wise, I would say, of course, I mean, forget about uh, that if you would like to use just one or several frequencies. So here to see all these small details, you really have to have a tunable frequency. Uh, for particular, this case in this frequency range, we use uh, VDIs, Virginia Diets, microwave sources, and this actually gave us an opportunity to, to study this crossover so, so much in detail. So, uh, uh, yeah, and this is a typical, actually, a typical spectrum at uh, about 300 gigahertz up to 60 or the 64 uh, Tesla. You can see, so we have soliton, we have breather excitations, and magnon. So, so just I would say the um, signal to noise is pretty good, assuming that so we are working with pulse field and the size of the sample about two by two millimeter. So this is, uh, I would like just to show you, this is what we can do in Dresden. And this is actually a user facility and everybody who are interested in high field, high pulse field, ESA can write proposal, come here and we will be able to assist you. So uh, another picture again, so this is a so-called uh, magnetic excitation large D spin one chains, DTM. And again, I mean, 
if you look at the phase diagram, you would end up with uh, three different phases. The high magnetic field phase is this fully spin polarized phase. So at low field, we have quantum paramagnetic state when the gap is open, and this is gap because of very big zero field splitting because of nickel. And uh, at intermediate field range, we have some, uh, some, some, some states which uh, can be described using Bose-Einstein condensation formalism. So this is BC phase. And the problem with this material was actually uh, people try to describe the phase diagram, including this BC state using different, uh, using spin Hamiltonian, which we obtain using different techniques. But the problem is again, so if you're, if you're, if you're dealing with quantum mechanical uh, objects, so, uh, so the quantum fluctuation effect of quantum fluctuations can be so strong that whatever you measure in the low field on high magnetic or uh, in zero field will be far away from the reality. So to get uh, important information about spin Hamiltonian parameters, you have to go to very high magnetic field where the uh, magnetization is saturated, and then so you 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 would need to you would need to uh, look at this uh, this um, excitation spectrum, and then from them you can exp uh, you can get um, accurately uh, the spin Hamiltonian parameters. And actually, this is what we did with this material. So we studied the excitation spectrum uh, above 12 Tesla. So you can see, so above 12 Tesla, we observe a number of excitations. And just using this, um, just making fit of this um, excitation spectrum, we were able to extract a very important spin Hamiltonian parameters. And using this spin Hamiltonian parameters, we were able to describe the phase diagram, including uh, the magnetization. And this is actually a transition from the quantum paramagnetic to ordered state. And this phase was, uh, phase diagram was calculated quite precisely using these parameters which we obtained from high field ESR. Uh, in addition to that, we were able to uh, observe so-called two magnon bound state. And this is quite interesting uh, um, uh, effect. Uh, so as I said, we have spin one, very isotropic uh, chain, and we are going to very high magnetic field above the saturation field. And this uh, so-called two magnon bound state were predicted for this uh, state by um, uh, Nikas Papa Nikolaou some, some you know, several decades ago. And actually, physically, these states corresponds to a simultaneous flip, simultaneous flip of two uh, uh, neighboring states, two neighboring spins. And this is something which uh, Quite typical, quite, quite characteristic uh, characteristics for for uh, spin one half um, material exchange couple material with large uh, exchange uh, with large anisotropy. On top of that, we also we were able to observe single magnon state. This single magnon state. This is uh, this is uh, mode uh, here. This is mode uh, C and E and F. These are so called two magnon bound states. So again, this is a a uh, very good example from my point of view, uh, showing why do we need why we need a high field ESR tunable frequency ESR. This is another example. This is a excitation of strong leg ladder. Uh, this organic material. So another name of this material is Dimpy in the Tamanaga Latanjara state. So uh, if we are talking about spin uh, ladder, so we can look at the, you know, reminds the situation when we have two couples spin one half chains and because of the, this coupling, the gap is open. The origin of this gap is completely a quantum mechanical. But once we apply magnetic field, this gap can be closed actually. And before the uh, system getting in the fully spin polarized states, also this uh, state, very unique state can be described as a tamanaga Latanger state. This is a very, say, interesting state when, um, so the saturation, uh, the, the, the excitation uh, uh, spectrum is actually supposed to be formed by spin-on excitation. This is not magnons, but spin-on and their bound state. And basically, uh, in this case, we didn't observe these spin-ons, but we observed, uh, I mean, we observed these spin-ons, but they are confined in magnons. And this actually confines spin on. So, this is a mode B, what we observed in this material. And this is a very characteristic feature again. And what we observed here, this is quite typical only for strong leg ladder. I didn't, at least, I didn't see anything else um, similar to that in any, any other 
quantum mechanical uh, materials. So uh, this is uh, one example when we use free electron laser. So this is a cup, uh, some, some material where um, uh, people observed, uh, researchers observed chiral skirmionic. Uh, again, so to describe these uh, skirmionic uh, features, it's very important. Or it was very important to understand what's going on there and actually uh, to get to extract the parameters of the spin Hamiltonian and using free electron laser so we were able actually to establish the fundamental magnetic interaction in this material. So saying that tetrahedra, couple tetrahedra, actually these are building blocks of this material. So, and then, so using this information, so we already can already describe the skirmionic, um, skirmionic behavior. So this is, uh, as I said, this uh, has been done using free electron laser and pulse magnetic field up to 64 Tesla. So these uh, frequencies are in wave numbers. And as I said, so very good things about free electron laser. It's relatively high, uh, very, relatively good tunability. And you see, uh, basically, the signal to noise ratio is not as, is, is not as bad in the sense of, of, of course, I mean, it depends on, on the frequency. But um, don't forget, this is pulse magnetic field. So we are not accumulating the signal. So we are just this one sweep <laughs> field filled up filled uh, and filled uh, filled up and filled down so this one one pass uh, collections of data and this is a frequency field dependent this is gray area this is phonons this is where the sample is not transparent and gain so that is why you have you you would need a tunability or multi-frequency approach and better tunability because just avoid heating of phonons uh, otherwise, you don't see anything. You would see the, the, your, your temperature, you know, if you're heating for non, your temperature is just sharply increase, crazy increase. Instead of 2K, for instance, you might end up with 10K quite easily, but slightly changing the frequency, tuned frequency. So the temperature goes back to 3K and you can actually measure <coughs> the excitation spectrum. This is a, yeah, <coughs> using three. This is how free electron, I mean, this is a final station of free electron laser. You can see this is a beam line. So a free electron laser actually located about 30 meters from the high field, most field cell. So there's another building and to connect the free electron laser facility and post <clears throat> field magnets, we have to build this as uh, almost 30 meters beam line. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is a final stage for free electron laser section and the magnet actually pass field magnet is downstairs. This is another very good example of showing that so we can, uh, we can use free electron laser not only as an electron spin resonance, but also electron uh, cyclotron resonance to study semiconductors, mate some semiconductor material. This is a um, yeah, excitation spectrum of um, nat natrium. Uh, this in uh, germanium, and you can see again, uh, so very good, uh, very good uh, lines, exciton lines. So it's another good uh, application for this combination of high field uh, and high frequency uh, EPR, cyclotron resonance, whatever. So this is, uh, I would like just to show our recent uh, installation. This is Edinburgh instrument uh, laser. This is a CO2 pumped molecular gas laser. And we decided just to use the same, uh, the same part of the beam line. And for that, we, we had to build a very simple scheme, actually, to make sure that the parameter of the beam here from this uh, molecular gas laser is the same as, a, is the same, is the same as that from free electron laser. So the, the beam here is about 40 millimeter diameter. So and then it, everything goes to the past field uh, we actually uh, recently quite uh, made some developments. So, for instance, we are using this um, yeah, computer controlled uh, stages. Uh, so, when we would like just to make our life slightly better, slightly easier. So, the point is, I mean, you adjust everything, and then you you, you have to leave this room, and you have to make sure that so the radiation, everything. You, you have to briefly check the radiation. Uh, density everything with the, your, 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 your laser at the same frequency having the same density and of course you have to do some some manipulations manipulations just to see I mean what, what's going on with modulation so that is why it's right now if you come to us you will see it's slightly different 
And of course, this is a helium neon laser, and this laser is used initially you know, uh, just uh, to make sure that so radiation comes to to the wave guide, to the wave guide, to the probe. And this, I believe, is quite quite nice. As I said, I'm I'm pretty much happy about this installation. I mean, it's not as tunable, but if uh, for some frequencies, for some research, when you do, you do really need a high high intensity and several lines, so this is like cyclotron resonance, for instance. Sometimes you don't need to many frequencies. You don't need 20, 30 frequencies. You need just one to three, and maybe this is a very nice uh, opportunity to do that. Uh, so this is one of our quite recent uh, results. So this is alpha ruthenium chloride, so-called Kitaev, Kitaev uh, model magnet. Uh, uh, so this uh, particular, this material uh, has a, this unicom -like structure, and this is a very famous material in saying that, so, uh, so they predicted so-called Majorana fermions for this material. So we, if we have a structure like that, so we have a Kitaev interaction, so Kitaev interaction, this is isn't type, they can, uh, isn't type this bond, bond dependent interaction. And particularly for this structure, so um, I say Kitaev sometimes ago predicted a special type of uh, uh, magnetic interaction. They are not spin on, they are not uh, magnon, they are not solitons, but they are Majoranas. And of course, a lot of, um, a lot of interest was initiated within that. And this actually, so Majorana and fermions were predicted for this magnetically disordered state. The problem with this material, this material is magnetically ordered in low field and in zero field. And so we are able to observe a gaps like 0 0.8 and 0 0.65 uh, gigahertz, uh, terahertz. These are magnons. But once you suppress uh, magnon states and from magnetically ordered state with uh, High magnetic field, you end up with magnetically disordered state. And for this, actually, for this state, this Majorana fermion were kind of uh, suggested. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry. And we, what we did actually, we did a very systematic, very accurate measurements using tunable frequencies. So, uh, and we studied this as a magnetically disordered state, and what actually we observed, uh, and what actually this proved, this. <clears throat> So we did not see any Majorana excitation, but what we are quite convinced, this uh, numerous excitations. So this is nothing else uh, as a just 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 magnons. And what we observed actually agrees very well with uh, Raman and fine infrared scattering, uh, Raman scattering, fine infrared spectroscopy. And uh, so the main conclusion, of course, I mean the Majorana fermions can be there. Uh, but of course, one should not forget, one should not neglect the, the presence of this uh, magnon excitation, which, which actually dominated in this, dominating in this high field phase. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to talk about slightly different uh, stuff. Mm, uh, I'm going to talk about pressure tuning exchange interaction triangle latest antiferromagnet. And this work actually has been done in collaboration with a number of people. And uh, I believe uh, very, um, uh, very peculiar feature of this investigation, this combination of actually of uh, three different techniques. This is high pressure, high pressure ESR, high pressure magnetization, I mean, magnetization, ESR, and, and high pressure. And I'm going to show you why, why I need these three different techniques, three different approaches uh, quite a, in a couple of minutes. This work has been done in collaboration with a number of people. Uh, I did high pressure magnetization in collaboration with David Graf from Tallahassee. And high field uh, ESR was done in Tohoku University. So this work in collaboration with Sakurai-san, Kimura-san, Bajiri, Sensei, he's actually so quite um, quite important person in this area, and Otosan, of course, and samples uh, from Ona San and Tanaka San from uh, from uh, Osaka and to uh, to Tokyo Institute of Technology. This uh, work has been recently, just one year ago, less a little bit more than one one year ago, published. So let's uh, let me talk about very some very um, let's say <clears throat> fundamental uh, aspects of uh, 
of our activity. So the idea is the following. I mean, it's clear uh, and it's very well known that uh, the, the, this ground state, the Managa Latangera state, this is something which can be realized in one dimension. And this is what we call quantum spin liquid. Uh, why it's quantum spin liquid? Why it's quantum spin liquid? Because there is no 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 uh, no magnetic ordering, so everything is fluctuating. But fluctuations, the origin of the fluctuation, not a thermal fluctuation, but quantum fluctuations. So the uh, the point is very simple. In low dimensional, it's most likely when you cool down the your system down to say absolute uh, zero temperature, so you would have zero temperature fluctuation. So you, you cannot uh, avoid uh, fluctuation. The origin is quantum fluctuation, quantum mechanical fluctuation. Uh, this is one thing. And second thing, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, particular enhanced and uh, spin one half or spin low spin uh, spin chains. Uh, but um, sometimes ago, it was 1973 when uh, Phil Anders uh, actually, uh, hepatitis, I would say, make state, made a statement on uh, that this quantum spin liquid can be realized in two dimensional materials. And this uh, quantum spin liquid states ha might have some relevance to um, high temperature superconductivity. And this is actually was a very, say, important message which he brought to scientific community because that time, and uh, I believe, Still, until now, there is no clear understanding why high temperature superconductivity so actually occurs and why it actually happens. There is no clear understanding, a complete understanding of this phenomena. And of course, if you would like to get an understanding of something complex, the best idea, best way would be just to go to something which is very modern. Very simple, and then when we collect your information, your knowledge about the uh, something very model, very simple, you can already extend your knowledge to something very much more complicated, much more complex. And uh, once uh, Phil Anders actually made this statement, so people actually rushed to the area of uh, two-dimensional quantum magnets, start looking for searching for two-dimensional uh, spin liquids. So as I said, there are one very important um, one very important property. So this is you know this state should be fluctuated, no 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 magnetic order. And second, of course, very important uh, very important property. This is quantum entanglement entanglement. So when we you know we cannot actually describe the wave function of ground state of one of one particle, not taking into account the the, the ensemble. So, uh, so this is uh, that is this is completely quantum mechanical principle. It's uh, very different. Uh, for instance, uh, when we have a paramagnetic state, but once we have this uh, states purely paramagnetic state, once we have interaction between particles and we go to low temperature, we should think how the wave function of the uh, of the group of of, of particles. Can affect the wave function of of, 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 of of the single particles, and of course, this is quite complex, not well understood right now. The process, and this is where we trying to look at. So, um, <clears throat> oh, so I'm going just uh, probably quite briefly come through uh, the concept of uh, geometrical frustrations. Uh, so, frustrating, which means we have one spin up, spin another spin down, and the third one, the third side doesn't know what to do. And because of that, so this um, quantum state, so actually this is a dimer state, actually can fluctuate, can jump from one state to another one. And this, if there is no uh, short, uh, long range order um, parameter, so uh, long range order <laughs> ordering, so the, we can end up, we can think about this uh, quantum spin liquid. So what you have to have, you have to have these dimers, and these dimers actually, this spin singlet can fluctuate, and this fluctuation actually create this uh, very exotic ground state. And this actually can be in triangulitis, can be cagomalitis, as I said, can be, for instance, in the, <clears throat> this is Kitai, um, this is honeycomb like materials, or even maybe pyrochlor, pyrochlor legis. So, because here we can also think about these dimers. What is important, the ratio between L temperature and Q device, and actually this gives you, <clears throat> this is 
a ratio of frustration. Uh, as I said, the, the, big, the largest difference between spin waves and spin-ons, uh, so they, although if you look at the excitation spectrum using elastic neutron scattering, you would see something similar, but in case of uh, spin-ons, we would see a uh, quite quite big difference in, in, in the intensity of scattering. And actually, this is what makes this um, observation so different. As I said, so we can describe this text. Uh, we can describe the <clears throat> spin waves using classical approach. But for spin-on continuum, of course, we should use a, a quantum mechanical language. And actually, this model Nice. Uh, it was uh, solved long time ago using beta enzymes. Uh, at least we know what to expect um, for quantum spin liquids. So we are going to expect some sort of uh, consinum, and this is what, uh, what 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 we are looking for. Um, so if to talk about two dimensional materials, there are a number. I would say not so big number of uh, two dimensional materials where this uh, where this. Uh, quantum speed spin liquid can be expected. And so we end up with a CZ2 kappa chlor 4. This material has a two-dimensional triangular lattice structure. This material is ordered antiferromagnetically at about 0.7 K. Uh, but below, uh, but above this, uh, this temperature, uh, so this are magnetically disordered, and this is actually where we might expect the quantum spin liquids. Uh, this is a uh, uh, magnetization. And let's think about uh, this material. First of all, this material, uh, the Gamingtonian is known for this material. So you, from inelastic you know, neutron scattering, saturation field can be reached using superconducting magnets and large single crystals are available. Uh, this material has a quite long history. Initially, it was identified, uh, determined as a quantum spin, dimensional uh, quantum spin liquid. But in reality, if you look at the inelastic neutron scattering data, you would see that there are some bound state, and this bound state is not typical for 2D. This actually would be, uh, what happens here, this is just because of frustration. So this, this material can be regarded as system as one, one half quantum spin chains. And because of interaction between these, these chains, so there are spin ons. It's not 2D quantum spin liquid, it is 1D spin liquids. Well, we did actually. Also, uh, heat transfer on this material, and we observed that this heat transfer is the most pronounced in one direction, so in the direction of the quantum spin chains, and that is why. So this is also quite straightforward, evident that so we, this is a one-dimensional uh, spin liquid, spin liquid, spin liquid, not 2D. Otherwise, we would see uh, different. <clears throat> we would see similar behavior in two different directions, so perpendicular to the to the plane. I mean. So in plane, but it seems to be so we have this enhancement of the um, heat transport only in one direction. This is direction along the chains. So okay, uh, if you look at the um, phase diagram of this uh, of this system, yeah, of this triangle latest antiferromagnets, uh, you would see different, 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 different materials. But what is important? So if you change, if you tune the J prime or J parameter, where J prime this is interaction. Uh, so J prime and J, J prime, this interaction uh, in triangular. So this is along the chains and on the diagonal, diagonal. And uh, when you change this J prime or J ratio, you um, can tune the, uh, actually the system from independent one dimensional antiferromagnetic chains when the interaction between these chains in triangular, triangulars is zero. And then so you end up with isotropic triangular order. And somewhere in between, there should be some transition so from spin liquid to this isotropic triangular order from, yeah, because this is when we have J prime over J, this is independent uh, one dent ferromagnetic chain. So this is spin liquid already ground state. And if you look, look at, the, at the literature, you will see a lot of a lot of different theories and they theories actually quite different, I would say. And of course, the idea would be if we can, uh, if we can actually tune the parameters uh, J prime over J using heterostatic pressure. So first of all, uh, why this material is very interesting. So just looking, as I mentioned, just looking at magnetic excitation at very high magnetic field, we can use a classical spin wave theory. We can look at the dispersion of, uh, of magnetic excitations. 
And we can observe actually not only a transition at k equal zero, but k equal pi. And this transition at k equal pi are allowed because of a staggered zolchinsky mori interaction. The translational symmetry is getting broken, reduced, and because of that, so the um, <clears throat> wave function gets mixed and as uh, as a result, so we can observe this transition. This is uh, not very often, I would say, case, but in this particular this case, we can see transition uh, at k equals zero and k equal pi, and this corresponds to relativistic, so this transition and this uh, corresponds to exchange mode. Yeah, and when looking at the difference between this mode, we can actually estimate j prime, and this is very good, and this is actually was applied for Cesi kappa bromide and Cesi kappa chloride. You can see here two different materials. And this, as I said, this splitting in this fully spin polarized states gives you, um, gives you this, you know, very accurately gives you, uh, you, you this um, J, uh, J prime. And then, so if you know this uh, J prime, you can look at the saturation field and you can actually get the exchange parameters, J and J prime. So as I said, so my idea was just to use a high pressure ESA for that I went to Tohoku University. You see, you can see here. So yeah, I did a high pressure ESA. So probably I will miss some details because we can uh, maybe you know, discuss it during, uh, uh, later. So, and this is actually, this is a pressure cell, <clears throat> how it looks like. So it's installed between two parts of waveguides. So these are mirrors. This is just transmission type. There's just no cavity, no, no, no resonator. And what is quite interesting here, this is uh, actually these parts made from um, uh, zirconium uh, ceramic, and these materials appears to be very good for microwave transmission. So it's attenuates, but not so much. And actually, radiation comes from here and comes. This is a sample, and this sample is a pressure pressure cell. Yeah, so I did, we did high pressure ESA, and you can see actually once you start applying pressure, we did it up to approximately up to, up to, to GPA. You can see that this line is getting shift. And this is actually very nice because shift of these exchange modes gives us information how J prime is changed as a function of pressure. As I said, so we need one more parameter, we need J. And for that, we need to do to look at the uh, saturation magnetization versus pressure. And for that, I came to Tallahassee. I use, uh, we use a tunneling diet, um, uh, tunnel, tunnel diet oscillator. So this is actually something which measure magnetization or susceptibility at radio frequency. So sample is stored here and so very small coil. It's about several, several tens, tens of, 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 of turns. And when, uh, once we sweep magnetic field and parameters, magnetic parameters, for instance, permeability, is changing sample because of phase transition. We can see this as a change of the uh, change of the frequency of the phase, if you want. And then, so we actually did these measurements as a function of pressure, and we actually were able to see how the saturation depends on magnetic field. And you can see, so we actually can build this saturation. And yeah, and we observed also uh, maybe a number of different, what is interesting when we apply uh, pressure, we observe a number of transitions. So it's uh, very interesting. So we are able by pressure, not, not only to change uh, saturation field, but some additional transition actually appears. I mean, we still don't know about exact, uh, we can only speculate about exact, uh, exact nature of this transition, but what is important, uh, we were actually able to build, and I believe this is main conclusion, main statement of this, uh, of this work actually. So now we know how the parameters J and J prime is change, are changed as a function of pressure. So which means we, we know which pressure we need to apply to see, we can actually tune J, uh, J, J prime and J as a function of pressure. And this actual information can be further used, for instance, for high pressure MUSR, high pressure susceptibility, high pressure Whatever, 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 because this is already some knowledge which can be used for, for other measurements, other, other measure uh, experiments. So, and of course, we demonstrate the possibility of quasi continuously tuned exchange parameters, and we observe about 70% increase of J prime and 40% increase of J prime over J. Yeah, as I said, we observe a number of new transitions, very interesting. And actually, we are on our way, actually, we are trying to understand what's going on. Uh, using different techniques, including neutron scattering, 
Yeah, probably I will skip conclusions and outlook. Uh, I think you saw already everything. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you. Questions? Okay. Please, I, I, Thomas. Yeah, okay. okay. Go ahead. So, briefly, so you, you are able to measure magnons and spin waves in terahertz, in the terahertz range or almost terahertz, too. And the, the, this is first question and second, what kind of samples do you have? I mean, it's bulk powder, or you can go also for thin films or how, how is it like, please? So mainly I'm working with, uh, we are working with um, bulk because of interpretation of powder can be quite, quite challenging. But if you don't have, uh, say, if, if, I mean, there is no principal limitation. We can work with bulk. We can work with uh, powder. We, we can work with uh, films. For instance, for cyclotron resonance, we are using films. Um, two main reasons, I mean, of course, as I said, so interpretation can be challenging, much more challenging for uh, powders or pellets. And second, of course, uh, sensitivity, if we are using 16 Tesla, say DC field, sensitivity really not very big issue. issue. This is actually the setup which I used in Tallahassee, pretty much the same and other, several other, many other places. But for past field measurements, of course, uh, you know, sensitivity is a very important issue, even if you have a quite intense uh, terogers radiation. So it's, it's very, it's quite, uh, it's different, I would say, but there is no, 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 no principal limitations. Okay, thank you. So, so you go also for anti-ferromagnetic materials, for instance, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is actually what we are doing most. Yeah. most yeah. Okay, thank you. So magnetic elevator, this magnetic elevator, magnetic elevator is even, even better because oscillation strength is quite big and uh, it's much easier to work with. Okay, thank you. Yes, Alessandro. Um, Sergey, do you see any, you see, you showed this very nice um, applications with gas lasers, which somehow extend the frequency range, uh, which is accessible with solid light sources from one terahertz to three or four. Do you see any possibility to use this as a pulse source? Oh yeah, certainly. How would you chop it? How would you cre create the pulses? Uh, first of all, so there are, I mean, it depends on the pulse duration. Of course, there is a possibility to, um, to use a trigger mode and pulse mode. Actually, I did not check it, but you can actually modulate the, uh, the radiation. So the, the, uh, this laser works in CW mode, but you certainly can work with, uh, in a pulse mode, just, just, just make a modulation. So I did not check, so it depends pretty much on the relaxation process, I believe so, the, the, the pulse duration, yeah? So you, you create emission and then you wait, but you can use, for instance, uh, something, you, you, can, you can use, uh, for instance, uh, some, some setup, for instance, people in Stanford are using, right? So using just semiconductor, semiconductor chopperos. This is also possible. Mm -hmm. So it's also possible, and I would say intensity nice, for instance, I mean, intensity, I would say 1.5 terahertz, we have like between 100 and 150 milli, milliwatts, which is, um, my understanding, it's, 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 it's much good. It's very good. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. And this is the really tabletop. 